Welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Uh, a few months ago, for many people, your name did not exist in their minds at all in any way, <laughs> and now you are uh, a superstar, especially for many young people because of your views in and around tax and the super wealthy around the world. How did you come to this from, from, from what you do? Because you're, you're a historian. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you are a Dutch historian. I, I'm a Dutch historian. That's how everyone refers to you, the <laughs> yeah. Dutch historian. I think, you know, I'm really part of a, of a much wider movement, you know, uh, a whole new generation that thinks that we need to move on to, to new ideas. Yes. And basically that realize that we need a massive transformation of our economy, so. And I was just in a place at the World Economic Forum where usually, you know, not many people get to go there. And it was just one of the few people there maybe right. talking common sense. We, we actually have a, a clip um, that went viral. If, if we can play that right now. Almost no one raises the real issue of tax avoidance, right? And of the rich just not paying their fair share. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters well, fighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water. This is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid <laughs> philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more, but come on, it's, we gotta be talking about taxes. Yeah, That's it, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit, in, in my opinion. So this was, to give people context, this was you sitting with the richest people in the world. Yeah. And you were, you, were, <laughs> you were actually supposed to be there to talk about just like the other aspects of your book, like universal basic yeah. income, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And you surprised everyone with that. They were not happy. They didn't really like that, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I mean, I was supposed to go there and promote my book, talk about universal basic income, yes. which has become a really popular idea. But, you know, during the conference, I became more and more uncomfortable uh, because you can talk about all sorts of issues there, right? feminism, participation, equality, but then no one raises the T word, right? You're not, don't, people don't really talk about taxes and yes. tax appointments. So I, I, I just went to my hotel room and prepared this short speech and I got the question from, from the moderator and basically ignored his question and then uh, went ahead. <laughs> <laughs> since that, since that little um, moment in Davos, have you noticed a few private jets following you now? Have you? Uh... <laughs> Because it, it seems like something that, that would piss a lot of really, really wealthy people off. That, yeah. that idea of them paying more tax and them avoiding it. Why do you think that's more important or should be like one of the main conversations uh, apart from transparency mm -hmm. and, and equality and philanthropy? Well, you know, I'm a historian, right? So um, if I see someone like, say, uh, President Trump talk about we should make America great again. He wants to go back to the 50s or something like that. I'm like, yeah, well, maybe that, that's a good idea because in the 50s, we have much higher tax rates for the rich. In fact, a billionaire like Trump would pay like 90% top marginal tax rate. Right. Uh, the, es the estate tax was over 70% uh, for people like Trump. So, uh, yeah, I mean, make America great again. Bring back those higher tax rates. That would be my slogan. <laughs> Do you... <laughs> there are... There are many people who would argue against you and say to you, yeah, I mean, you, you, you say you want to raise taxes on, on the wealthy, but the wealthy are already paying their fair mm -hmm. share of taxes. People are paying almost 50% of what they earn. Isn't that fair? Mm -hmm. How do you respond to them? You know, there's this whole boring debate in this country about, you know, capitalism versus socialism. Um, from my perspective, it sounds a bit ridiculous. Like, we're talking about ideas like Medicare for all. 70% of all Americans is in favor of that. Higher taxes on the rich, 75% is in favor of that. Right. So it's utterly mainstream. And I know that sort of the standard response here is always, ooh, that sounds like communism. That sounds like Venezuela. But it's not communism. It's common sense. Right? <laughs> it's, it's what most people support. Let me, let me ask you this. One of, one of the things I know get, that gets thrown at me all the time is people go, oh, you, you, you raise the taxes and everyone's going to leave because, I mean, you know, if you, if you raise the taxes for the rich, then the rich are going to go live in countries mm -hmm. where they don't have to pay as much tax and you've lost all of those incomes and you've lost all of those people in your country. Well, America is the most powerful country in the world. You know, it can easily crack down on tax paradises like Holland, where I'm from, right? right. We're one of the main tax paradises for American corpora corporations. So, you know, that's really a matter of... of political will, I guess. Just them being willing to say, hey, we're gonna tax you no matter where you go, yeah. no matter what you do. Yeah. It, it's interesting that you, you, you fight for these ideas when you come from Europe. People would say to you, but, but Radka, you, you come from a country where things are great. You do have all of these services. People are not struggling as much as they are in other parts of the world. Why is this so important to you then? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the American debate is incredibly influential back in Holland, right? So, uh, uh, and we've got 
rising inequality in Europe as well, right. uh, and uh, the welfare state that is under pressure. But I mean, it's also true that if I look at a debate right around Medicare for all, for example, America is the only country in, in the, the, the rich world that doesn't have it. And still it has the most expensive healthcare system and, and life expectancy is going down. So yeah, that seems pretty ridiculous. You have a bunch of ideas that many people would consider ridiculous depending on their age, and I find a lot of young people genuinely love as genius. Mm -hmm. um, Utopia for Realists is the book mm -hmm. that you wrote, and it's come back into prominence again because you, 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 it's just like a fun read. You talk about all of these ideas and how they could actually be implemented, which is interesting. It's not just the ideas. Universal basic income, uh, open borders, 15-hour work week. Really, just, I mean, this is like a book. This is like Freddy Krueger for a GOP person. <laughs> this, is, this is like nightmare stories. That's yeah. what this is. Indeed. Did you um, see the picture of Rupert Murdoch reading I actually book? did. I did see that. We have that picture, Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, how it, do you feel about that? There is, there is one of the people you're yeah. speaking about. I, I framed it, obviously. It's a, it's a, right. it's a picture, yeah. Like, w when you talk about these issues, like universal basic income, for instance, mm -hmm. seems like a, a, a crazy idea. You're just yeah. going to pay people to not work then why would anyone work? Yeah. Well, what not, not many people know, actually, is that if you go back to the 60s, almost everyone believed, all the experts believed, that some form of basic income was going to be implemented in the United States. And it was actually Richard Nixon, of all people, who had a bill for a modest basic income that got through the House of Representatives twice and was only killed in the Senate by Democrats, not because they didn't like the idea of completely eradicate po eradicating poverty, but because they wanted a higher basic income. So it's a, it's a pretty bizarre history uh, wow. that I, you know, describe in the book. Uh, another another bizarre thing is that actually there were major trials with basic income in the U.S. back then. You know, thousands of families received a basic income just yes. to test what would happen. Turns out it was really effective. You know, healthcare costs went down, crime went down, kids did much better in school. But then there was one problematic finding: is that they also found that the divorce rates went up. You know, quite a lot because a lot of women were like, okay, I'm gonna leave that, that asshole. <laughs> and, uh, um, but, then, but then all the conservatives obviously said, okay, we don't want basic income anymore. This is gonna make women much too independent, right? It was only 10 years later that they found out that they had made a statistical mistake. So in reality, the divorce rate did not go up. Oh, it's, man. it's a pretty bizarre history full of that. Wait, let, me, let me ask you this then, as, as a historian, who is basing your arguments on things that have actually happened, does it frustrate you when you see politicians like Trump, um, I guess, misstating their plans based on a history that they, that they don't seem to understand mm -hmm. themselves? Because like you said, Trump says, we're gonna do it the way it was, but then when you propose the way it was, he's like, no, I, I, I don't like that. Do you think that as people in general, we just don't know enough about our histories? Well, what frustrates me the most are these people, the so-called moderates, the centrists, who say, oh, that's never going to happen. You know, that is too radical. Right. Uh, if you zoom out a little bit, you see that so many times in history, utopian fantasies have become reality. Um, I think as? that's important to keep in mind. You know, the, the democracy was once a crazy idea, right? right? The end of slavery was once a total fantasy. It all happened, but it never starts in the center. It always happens, starts on the fringes with people who are first dismissed as radical, as crazy, as, as lunatics, right? So uh, I guess we gotta be a bit unreasonable sometimes. You have to be unreasonable to move the conversation forward. The 15-hour work week is probably my favorite part of your book. <laughs> how, how does that even begin to work? Yeah, well, it, it goes back to a very old idea, actually, of the, the economist John Maynard Keynes. He wrote this essay in 1930 that you know, sort of make two predictions. The first prediction was, we're gonna be a lot richer in the future, right? Mm -hmm. If we don't make stupid mistakes, like start another world war or have right. austerity during times of crisis, well, we did that, but anyway. <laughs> we'll be a lot richer, and then we'll use that wealth to work a little bit less each year. And um, then he just extrapolated and said, we'll have a 15-hour work week in 2030. The fascinating thing, again, from the historical perspective, is that up until the 70s, you know, we were on track to, to make it. You know, the work week was shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And the experts were predicting that the biggest challenge of the future was going to be boredom. It's only around 1980 that, you know, throughout the developed world, we've been starting to working more and more. And we've been keeping on inventing these jobs that don't really need to exist. Right. Right? So people sitting in offices, sending, sending emails all day to people they don't really like and writing reports no one's, <laughs> no one's ever going to read. Right? So uh, that's what they... The, the, the academic term is bullshit jobs. 
Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, it's just like basically you just sit there and then you just like, uh, to whom it may concern, reply all as per my last email, etc., etc. Et exactly, yes, yeah. That's for half yeah. of my day. But then the, um, fascinating, <laughs> the fascinating thing is, is that most of these, these jobs, you know, are people who have wonderful resumes, you know, who went yes. to great universities and have wonderful job titles, but then still at the end of the day, they're, they're like, mm, you know what, well, I could go on strike and no one would notice. Um, so in the book, I've got this story of two strikes that happened in, yes. in, in the 60s. The first strike was of garbage collectors, New York, 1968, lost it for six days. State of emergency had to be declared. It turns out we can't do without garbage collectors. Right. So at that point, I wondered, has it ever happened you know, in history that the bankers went on strike? Yeah? So I started looking, you know, looked at the past 5,000 years, basically, since the invention of money. And I found only one example. And this was in Ireland, uh, 1970. The bankers were angry that their wages were not keeping up with inflation. So they said, you know what, you'll have it. We're going to go on strike, and then you'll see just how important we are. And all the experts were like, oh, this is going to be a disaster. It's going to be a heart attack for the economy. And then from one day to the other day, 85% of the money supply was not accessible anymore. And then nothing much happened, actually. So um, <laughs> the strike lasted for six months in the end. And after six months, the bankers came back and said, all right, all right, all right, we'll get back to work. <laughs> and uh, I think. This is another example where history just makes you rethink, right? Who are the real wealth creators right, right. In, this, in this country? Is, does wealth really, you know, is it really created at the top and then does it trickle down? Or maybe it's the other way around. And are, are the teachers and the garbage collectors and the nurses, are they the real wealth creators? Wow, that's powerful, man. Um, let me ask you this as a historian. If we don't take these concepts seriously, if we don't think about how we protect workers and not the jobs themselves, if we don't think about how to get people paying their fair share of taxes, how we uh, stop people avoiding tax, which mm -hmm. is a huge issue, what do you then worry would happen based on history? Well, what I worry about the most is, is that if, about the moments when people just don't have hope anymore for, for a better future, right? So my frustration a couple of years ago when I started writing this book was that I saw so many people, you know, young people or people who call themselves progressives, who only knew what they were against, right. right? Against austerity, against racism, against homophobia, against all these things. That, and yes, I'm against them as well. But you also have to know what you're actually for. Right. And that's why I'm so excited that you see this whole movement now of, indeed, younger people who come up with all these fascinating new ideas, sometimes old ideas, sometimes new ideas like the, the Green New Deal. Uh -huh. um, that's what excites me the most, because we need hope. Wow. Thank you for being on the show, man. Really great having you on. Utopia for Realists is a really fascinating read. It's available now. Rutger Bregman, everybody. <laughs>